Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be back in ICTS. Uh, uh, you might think from my talk that the uh, that the talk has nothing to do with the topic of the conference, and you'll, you'd largely be correct, um, but not entirely. Okay, uh, one more apology about this. I have never before talked about a subject in which the last paper I wrote was five years ago. This is a subject of that sort. Uh, nonetheless, Loga said he thought it would be useful, so here goes. Okay. Um, my talk is based on uh, largely on work done by two groups of people. The, the first group of people is Emperan, Suzuki, and Tanabe. Um, their principal papers are listed here. The second group of people is myself and my collaborators, and our principal papers are listed here. Okay. Now, oh my God, it's the wrong. Okay, I'm sorry, it's the wrong, uh, but it's fine. Okay. Um, um, as all of you know, uh, black holes are fascinating objects. Now, a remarkable thing about black holes is that the fascinating dynamics that black holes undergo are governed by simple equations that we know more or less without approximation. This is the equation, Einstein's equations of, of, of general relativity. Despite the simplicity of the governing of these governing equations, describes phenomena that are extremely complicated. In that sense, these equations are very much like the Navier-Stokes equations, which are simple but describe very complicated phenomena. Okay, now despite the simplicity of these equations, um, in many situations, for instance, when two black holes collide, we don't really have a handle, uh, an analytic handle on the dynamics of these equations. Um, often you have, you're forced to go to a computer. And uh, for some, some of us, this feels unsatisfying. Okay, so when faced with an interesting but intractable uh, problem, one strategy for progress is to change the problem by introducing a parameter in some generally some natural way. Uh, with the hope that while your problem may sit at a value of the parameter where the problem is intractable, you can move to another value of the problem, a parameter where the problem is more tractable. Okay, in this talk, I will adopt the strategy. Uh, in the main part of my talk, my parameter will be one over D, where D is the number of space-time dimensions. Okay, so uh, I will use this as my parameter, so I will move to studying black holes in very large space-time dimensions in order to make uh, this problem tractable. Um, but as a warm up for this one over D story, I'll first recall an older, and it will turn out, related context uh, in which a similar strategy led to something interesting. Uh, this older context is something called the fluid gravity correspondence. Okay, so what's the basic idea there? Suppose you're in ADS space, okay, and you want to study Einstein's equations uh, with a negative cosmological constant. So these are equations that admit pure ADS space as a solution, and uh, many, other solu many other solutions are solutions. Now the simplest, as, as I've just said, solution to these equations is just ADS space. The next simplest solutions to these equations are a big black hole, are a black hole sitting in ADS space. Now, if you take this black hole to be very small compared to the size of ADS, the black hole behaves very much like it's a black hole in flat space. You cannot tell that it's sitting in the cold space. One might wonder, does something, you get something by taking the other limit, where you take the black hole and make it very large compared to this. Make it, you know, make it as big as you can, make it very, very big. Maybe something, something nice happens at that limit. Um, it's a black hole. In the extreme limit, it becomes what we call a black brain. But for any finite mass, it's a black hole. It has an event horizon. General relativists would call it black hole. Okay. So in this limit where this RH is a measure of how big the event horizon is, RADS is the curvature of ADS space, um, we take this limit that the, the size of the black hole is very large and then do some sort of uh, coordinate, coordinate uh, some related coordinate transformation. This effectively turns this black hole, as we were just discussing, into what people sometimes call a black brain. So what's a black brain? A black hole, like in flat space, or a small black hole in ADS space, um, is a black hole whose event horizon is a sphere. We were looking at four-dimensional flat space. The event horizon is a two-sphere. Uh, two In this limit, this scaling limit, 
the event horizon of this black hole has become effectively an R2. Okay, so it's translationally invariant in event horizon. Excellent. Now, so what we've got from this, from this very large limit, one of the things we've got from this very large limit is replacing spherical symmetry by translational. Basically, because you're effectively zooming in on a little patch of the sphere. The sphere has become very big. Okay. Now, um, as you're familiar with, a classical question of interest in the study of black holes uh, is often the following. If I take the black hole, I hit it. I watch it settle down. What are the time scales for the settling down? Okay. The mathematical version of this problem is uh, formulated in terms of what, what are called quasi normal limits. Okay, so given a black hole, a problem that is of physical and mathematical interest is what is the spectrum of quasi normal modes, the spectrum with which uh, the black hole settle down if you hit it. Okay, in this context, quasi normal modes are labeled not by spherical harmonics, but by momenta. Now, I'm just going to tell you a few things. Turns out that the spectrum of quasi normal modes about a black brain has two different kinds of modes. There are a finite number, d minus one of modes, which have the special property. As k, you take k to zero for these modes, the momentum to zero, the frequency of these modes goes to go to zero. These are like massless modes in particle physics. Finite perturbations are infinite. Finite. I mean, they're just linearized perturbations around this. Um, they're labeled by momentum, so they're infinite in the in the in the translational direction. They're finite at the radius. There. There's finite energy, all good things. Okay. So these are like zero modes, like massless modes in a, in a particle physical, uh, physics context. And then the spectrum of quasi normal modes has an infinite number of other modes. This infinity of other modes corresponds to like the analog of massive modes. These are modes whose frequency omega and also the imaginary part of the frequency of omega remains finite in the limit k goes to zero. So these are modes that decay even if they are very, very long in wavelength. Okay, now every time in physics that you have a situation where you've got a few light modes and an infinite number of many heavy modes, it's almost always the case that there's something to be gained by integrating out the heavy modes and making an effective nonlinear theory of the light modes. You can do that in this gravitational context. We can integrate out the heavy modes, make an effective nonlinear theory of these light modes, and ask what is the effective equation of motion for these light modes. And the answer is something in, very nice. Turns out that the, if we're working in ADS D plus one, the answer is that the effective equations of motion for these light modes are, are the equations of hydrodynamics in D space-time dimensions. Okay? The, this is for the perturbation, right? perturbation but non-linearly. It's not necessarily, not necessarily that it's small. Okay, you just have to have, it's the validity of this is as long as the wavelengths are large. Okay, the equation is del mu t mu nu equals zero, hydrodynamics, with t mu nu given by constitutive relations that determine the stress tensor in terms of thermodynamic data, in terms of a pressure, which is itself you can think of as being determined by a local temperature and a, a local velocity. Okay, the equations of gravity produce this equation for you. They produce the form of the stress tensor, including corrections higher at higher, higher orders in derivative expansion. And uh, uh, right, so this is the effective theory of these light modes in that context. Please. Sigma, sigma is a number. Uh, oh, sorry, sigma mu nu is the usually shear tensor, the shear tensor. Okay, so it's just symmetrized derivatives of velocities projected to be orthogonal to the form velocity. Okay. Yes. Okay, uh, this two comes out of calculation, gives you the value of the viscosity. Okay, so it's, it's fluid dynamic equations with a particular viscosity. You've got a higher order, particular other coefficients. This just is Einstein's equations, rewritten in this particular context. Okay, great. So what we've discovered is that if you take these very large black holes and you let them wiggle around at long wavelengths, they're described by the equations of hydrodynamics in one lower dimension. Quite amazing, right? Okay, let me emphasize a few points. Effective hydrodynamical equations, presumably, uh, you guys know much more about this than I do, but presumably define a well-posed initial value problem. I can specify initial data and specify the evolution. Okay, the same is certainly true in gravity. 
In gravity, you can specify initial value and look at evolution. So what we've got here in this long wavelength limit is a precise map between two interesting nonlinear equations. Perhaps two of the best studied nonlinear partial differential equations in physics. I mean, Navier-Stokes equations on one side and the equations of Einstein gravity on the other side. The second thing to note is that the effective e equations, we started out with gravity. The effective equations that we got were not gravity equations. They were just equations of you know, hydrodynamics, same equations that you'd get if you were looking at a gas of, I don't know, photons. No gravity was needed for that. Right? Why did we land on familiar non-gravitational equations when studying in a gravitational context? Well, there are many possible explanations, but one explanation is a very nice one. It's the ads cf equation. We know that gravity in ADS space is the same as a field theory. And the, the dynamics of a field theory at very high energy densities is that of hydrodynamics. So you should have got something non-gravitational. This is an illustration of ads cf Okay. And uh, this paragraph is to show off that these results have been useful. Let's forget that. Okay. Um, now, good, something like everything I've told you about was about gravity in ADS space. That's very nice for string theorists who like ADS space, but maybe unfamiliar for people interested in gravity who would prefer to look at, let's say, black holes in flat space. Good, something like fluid gravity work for Schwarzschild black holes in flat four-dimensional space-time. You know, like the kinds of things that collide with each other and measured by LIGO. Uh, could the equations of nonlinear oscillations of the black hole reduce to something like the equations of hydrodynamics in some three on some three plus one dimensional slice? Um, surely not. Why not? You see, the key point in what I told you about earlier was this mass gap. We had these quasi normal modes. There were some a small number of very light modes. The rest were, were parametrically heavier than the right modes. That is the key for finding, always the key for finding a uh, you know, consistent effective description for a small number of modes in a situation where there are many more modes. Okay, well, if you look at a black hole in flat space, you have um, the black hole comes with an event horizon radius R. Okay, um, if you imagine that you've got some effective theory on this event horizon, um, its modes would presumably live on some sort of sphere of radius RH, let's say. And therefore, its modes would have a mass gap set by 1 over RH. But 1 over RH is also the only scale in the gravitation. So it's also the scale for the quasi-normal modes, the, the heavier quasi-normal modes. All quasi-normal modes in this problem are of, a scale, of mass scale 1 over RH. So the problem, if you look at a black hole in flat space... What do you know about the stability of this equation that you have done? About the hydrodynamic equations? Yes. Will it grow? Will it decay? Will it... Well, linear, linearly, it's completely stable. Oh, okay. And mm. what about nonlinear? I suppose it depends. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't know anything about, that. anything about that. Yeah. Okay. The linear spectrum is, of course, just sound waves and shear waves. You can compute them. Yeah. Okay. Now, in this flat space black hole situation, you may have some lightest modes. But then, you know, if they have mass E, the next heaviest modes will have, let's say, mass or energy, three. You can't keep one while ignoring the other. Okay, so there can be no decoupling. Nothing sort of so, so nice can happen in flat space. This is not very surprising. Something as interesting as, you know, going from gravity to fluid dynamics presumably requires a parameter. It's too much to ask for it to happen in general. Okay, so now we're going to go and try to invent our parameter. Then we're going to start working with black holes at large values of D. Okay, so consider the D-dimensional Schwarzschild black hole boosted to velocity UM. So UM is just, so, uh, you know, some D-velocity. So it has both time and space components, squares to minus one. Okay, and we present metric for this black hole in coordinates that may be unfamiliar to some of you. The, what, called, what, are, what are called Kerr shield coordinates. And with the coordinates that Kerr used in, in writing down the Kerr metric. Okay, so the metric of just a Schwarzschild black hole in these funny coordinates takes this form. This is a Schwarzschild black hole boosted so that it's four velocities even. Okay, now Emperor and Suzuki and Tanabe many years ago, almost what eight, seven, eight years ago, um, oh more, more, ten years ago, 
uh, made the following simple but key observations. First, if you look at this black hole, if you look at this metric, uh, notice that this metric becomes indistinguishable from the metric at flat space of flat space for any r greater than r naught in the limit that r by r naught is held fixed and these taken to infinity. This is simply because any number greater than one to the power infinity is infinity and one over infinity is zero. So this term just goes away and you're left with the term. Okay? So if you keep the ratio of r by r naught, how the ratio of how much beyond the event horizon you are fixed, take d to infinity, you don't see that you're, you've got a black hole at all. Okay, this is first observation. Um, oh, sorry, uh, any, dimension. any dimension, but I, I wanted to say that if you take, let's say R by R naught is 1.1, okay? If D is 10, you see the tail of the black hole. But in the limit D goes to infinity, you just don't see it. Okay, you can make that statement more precise. Suppose we take R is equal to R naught into one plus R divided by D minus three. So we go to a new coordinate such that our coordinate is not R anymore, but this capital R. Notice that capital R is tells you how far you are away from the black hole in units of one by D. Okay, well, one by D minus three, but that's the same as one D is large. Okay, now we keep R fixed and take D to infinity. So this means that as we take D to infinity, we're zooming in on the event horizon. So we're always staying a distance one, the, one over D away from it. If we do that, then you plug that into, into this metric. Then instead of going to zero, this term goes to e to the power minus r. Okay? This tells you how near you have to be to the horizon in order to see it. If you're, you're you know, in large D, you're looking at the horizon from outside, you just don't see anything until you come to a distance of order one over D from the event horizon. Then you start seeing that there's an event horizon. Okay. So the key point here is that there are two different length scales in black holes at large scale. First, that's the size of the black hole, the Schwarzschild radius, R0. That's a length scale. Second, there's the thickness of the event horizon, the distance beyond the event horizon that you have to be in order to actually see that you've got a black hole. That's R0 by D. So there are two effectively different length scales. Okay. Does the second length scale show up in anything dynamically interesting? So Emperor Suzuki and Tanabe in that same paper, answer, or maybe a subsequent paper, answered the, this question by computing the spectrum of quasi-normal modes, these quasi-normal modes we talked about. And what they found was that um, most modes, most quasi-normal modes, have an energy scale set by this length R0 by D. So their energies were one over R0 by D, and therefore D by R0. But there were a finite number of light modes that were much lighter. Their energy was set by one over R naught. Okay, so now when we've got this new parameter, namely D, we're in the same situation as Emperor Suzuki and Tanaka. Okay, oh, sorry, we're in the same situation as fluid gravity, where we've got a few light modes, lots of very heavy modes. So once again, we can play the game of trying to integrate out the heavy modes and find the effective theory for the light. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Let me tell you what I mean. Because, um, consider, um, let me say it in context of ADS space. I can also define it if you want in flat space. Say I've got a black hole. Okay. I've got a black hole which has some event horizon. A quasi normal mode is just the spectrum of the wave equation. So let's say if we were studying a scalar field, the wave equation would be del square phi equals zero. We look at the spectrum of this wave equation around the space time. But now in order to give this, to give this spectrum, to make, give that question meaning, we need to specify boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are that this thing is normalizable at the ADS horizon and ingoing at the black hole horizon. With these boundary conditions, this problem is mathematically well posed, has a definite spectrum. The, the, this is the spectrum of quasi normals. So modes that obey these boundary conditions are called quasi normals. In flat space, this normalizability at infinity of ADS space is replaced by outgoing at infinity. Okay? Physically, it's relevant because it governs the relaxation of a black hole back into the deep. Okay. Other question? Okay, great. 
Great. I'm giving you like two minutes about this. It's not very important, but let me, let me just give you two minutes about this. How this works. Consider any metric that is of the form uh, gmn is equal to eta mn times this stuff where rho is any function in ambient Minkowski space. Now, compare this to what we had here. If rho was this particular function, and if um, these u's here were vector fields that happen to be constants, then this metric reduces to the metric we had. So in this metric, um is any vector field, and rho is any function of ambient Minkowski space. In the limit that, you know, in, for, in the particular case that um was a, vector, was a constant vector field and rho was that particular function that I showed you, we have, you know, that, that, that this configuration reduces to the solution for a spherical black hole. We demand that this u is a velocity field, that it squares to minus one. And uh, uh, we demand that it's orthogonal to the normal vector of constant rho surfaces. Okay, so this velocity field lives tangent to constant row surfaces. Okay, but other than that, we allow these u and rho to be just absolutely anything. Now, everything I said about that earlier metric holds more generally for rho. Um, if rho minus one is much, much larger than one over d, then this metric is just flat space. Same argument as before. Okay, now, now this surface rho equals one is special. Um, the surface rho equals one special. It's going to turn out that eventually it will be the event horizon. This special surface has the property that when viewed as a submanifold of the of this dynamical metric, it's a null surface. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, here I've done the computation of the norm of this uh, of the uh, um, uh, of the normal to the rho rho equals one uh, in this metric, and because this is evaluated at rho equals one, this is zero. Okay, so uh, these two things are just algebraic facts. Okay, nothing very deep. Now, the remarkable result that requires work to show is the following. Provided the function rho is chosen so that it obeys this, this equation, del squared one over rho to the power d minus three is equal to zero. And provided the surface rho equals one and the velocity fields restricted to its surface obey equations of motion that we're going to discuss in detail in two minutes. Then this metric, which is, you know, just something, is not just something. It is a metric that is near to a solution of Einstein's equations and can be systematically corrected, whether systematic corrections are in a power series expansion one over d, to a true solution of Einstein's equations. Okay. Fine. As this process is iterated to higher and higher orders, where am I? Um, um, the membrane equations, the equations I haven't yet told you about, get corrected, just like the fluid equations in the earlier part of the talk got corrected in a form that's determined by Einstein's equation. Very unlikely. Almost no perturbation expansion in physics converges. Very unlikely. Yeah. Uh, okay. Excellent. Um, so, um, fine. Now, I have to tell you, you remember I told you that if two conditions were obeyed, this rho obeyed this equation, that was not the important part. Also, the shape of the surface, the velocity field on the surface obeyed some equations. If that happened, then, we, then, then I could correct the solution order by order to make a true solution of Einstein's equations. So what were these equations? These equations take a very nice form. They take the form of Conservation of, of a stress tensor. The conservation is conservation full ambient flat space time. Okay? Now, the stress tensor has a form. It's delta function localized on rho, rho equals one. So, if you're thinking about the flat space, and there's a membrane with zero thickness living in flat space, that's what this is saying. It's living exactly where rho equals one was in the gravitational cellular. Now, this stress tensor, I'll give you its form in a minute, turns out to be orthogonal to the normal vector, normal to rho equals one surface. Okay. Um, now, as this guy is always orthogonal to its normal, the stress tensor can be pulled back onto the world volume of the membrane and used, viewed as an intrinsic stress tensor. I will often refer to the intrinsic stress tensor by, as T-beauty. Now, the results of our explicit computations 
at lowest non-trivial order, and these computations have been done to at least one and maybe higher orders, uh, is that the stress tensor takes the following form. Stress tensor takes the form which we call T fluent plus T total derivative. T total derivative, and I'll tell you why total derivative in a minute, um, uh, is given by this, where k mu nu is the extrinsic curvature of this surface embedded in flat space. And k here is, some, is defined here. Um, at large d, to leading order, it's just given by this divided by this. And so it's trace of the extrinsic curvature plus connection. OK, T fluid is um, the projector orthogonal to the velocity minus the shear uh, with this k um, uh, behind it. And the shear is the usual shear. OK, now the remaining, uh, you know, I've, I've told you that this stress tensor, when you check it, uh, the stress tensor, when you check it, has the form that it's orthogonal to the normal to the membrane. Because of that, um, uh, d out of these, the d dimension, the d equations that we get from the conservation of this, this uh, space time stress tensor, one of them trivializes, just works as an identity. Okay. Um, it's not because of that. It turns out that this, this happens that if you take del n t n m and dot that equation with n m, turns out that if you just check with, with, with the form of the stress tensor, this equation is just an identity. It's not, it's not telling you something about the, how dynamics happens. It's just true. OK. So the remaining equations are d minus 1 in number. And these d minus 1 number equations can all be viewed from the point of view of the world volume of the world. Now, it turns out that on the world volume of the membrane, the conservation of this quantity is also an identity. It's actually one of the constraint equations, constraint Einstein equations corresponding to the row slicing in flat, of flat space. OK, so the equation of motion just becomes d mu t mu nu of the fluid part is equal to zero. OK, now, I know these equations are complicated and unfamiliar. Uh, what is the point? The point is this. We have d minus 1 non-trivial equations for d minus 1 variables. What were the d minus 1 variables? One of the variables was the shape of the membrane. The remaining d minus 2 variables, uh, the remaining d minus 2 variables were a velocity field that lived on the membrane. On the membrane. You might think that was d minus 1, because the, the membrane is some co-dimension 1 surface. So a vector field in that is d minus 1 the, uh, variables. But remember, velocity field squared to minus 1. So it's actually d minus 2, two variables. So we've got d minus 1 equations for d minus 1 variables. This is the key point of the slide. OK? And the, so you've got what is presumably, and I'll give you more evidence for this statement in a minute, a well-posed set of equations for d minus, d minus 1 equations for d minus 1 variables. So it's presumably a well-posed set of equations that is once again non-gravitation. And in this large D limit is, for many situations, that is for situations where the, uh, where the black hole varies on length scale that is longer than R0 by D, okay? Is a recasting of the equations of black hole dynamics. Okay, so the equations that we have are essentially hydrodynamical equations of a varying surface. So it's like a soap bubble with a fluid living on it. The fluid can move and the shape of the soap bubble can, bubble can vibrate around. And these are the equations for that. These are not equations I invented. They come out of Einstein's equations. So I suggest they be taken seriously. OK, one odd feature of this, this please. Yeah, it's, uh, it's sort of incompressible. As you will see, the incompressibility, almost incompressible. Uh, this del dot u is not exactly 0, but is very small. This is 1 over d suppressed. Okay. Right. Um, it's one thing odd about this equation. You know, if you took a normal fluid, it would have an energy density, a velocity, and shape. Okay. In this fluid, the energy density is determined by the shape. This is familiar from black holes. Temperature of the black hole is set by extrinsic curvature. Temperature is a geometrical quantity. For fluids, it seems odd, but it's just true for, for this guy. OK, so it's a funny kind of fluid. It's variables do not have an energy density, it's shape and velocity. OK, I didn't order this. It came out of Einstein's equations. Fine. 
Okay. Yes. Um, I don't understand what you're calculating if you don't have fluid energy density as being relevant. Fluid energy density. We've got something that has, it's like the, you know, something proportional to the uh, um, projector orthogonal to velocity. So this is a little like in the fluid that a situation would be like the pressure. Okay, it's just that the pressure is not an independent variable as it would be maybe in the, in, in the compressible things again, it's not independent. In a relativistic fluid, pressure and, and velocities are completely independent variables. You can have temper, local temperature fluctuations and velocity fluctuations. Okay, here we've got the same kind of form, the same kind of stress tensor that you would get in hydrodynamics. Okay, just that we've got a formula for the pressure, the effective pressure in terms of the shape of the membrane. Is this clear? Yep. So it's very fluid-like. And you will see in a minute how much more fluid-like it becomes. I'll have to skip much of what I have and just get to the main point. Okay. Um, uh, just two, three things. Fluid dynamics is usually equipped with an entropy current that tells you that the second law of thermodynamics and fluid dynamics works locally. This fluid here also has an entropy current. Uh, we see that by taking this equation, del mu t mu nu is equal to zero and dotting it with mu. Since that was zero, the dot, dot product of that with u nu is also zero. And when we work this equation out, turns out that it takes the form del dot u is equal to this guy. Okay? The important thing about this guy is that's positive there. It's a perfect square. Okay? And because of that, we, it is tempting to, and I'll tell you we have to, identify this, in fact, this by four, as the entropy current associated with this fluid. Okay? Once you make that identify, identification, you get del dot j is equal to some dissipation term, which is sigma square. Again, very familiar from hydrodynamics. Now, why did I make this identification in particular, this identification with four? What I did was take Hawking's area increase theorem uh, for the black hole event horizons. We know that in black holes, the local area element is the entropy. I took Hawking's area increase theorem, and I just pulled it back to this flat space membrane. And the, the, the area element gave me what, what the entropy current should be on this membrane. And they gave me the U with the four. The four there was, you know, the same four in hawking beckons type formula. Okay. Okay. Okay, excellent. Let's keep going. Um, these, 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 uh, one, one last thing and then I'll get, I'll get to the point. I'll skip most of the other stuff. Uh, one last thing and I'll get to the point. Last thing is this. Um, I found these solutions of Einstein's equations, order by order and one over D. You can ask, where were these solutions valid? Turns out these solutions were valid when rho minus one is much, much less than one. Not all the way to infinity. However, the solution of the black hole becomes very close to flat space for rho minus one, much, much greater than one by D. So you see, there's... Two, two places where you can solve the equations. When rho is much, much less than one, you solve using R techniques. When rho is much, much greater than one by D, you can solve linearizing gravity. There's a region where both these approximations are valid, and you can match solutions where both are valid, and use that to see how much this membrane motion leads to radiation. Turns out that, um, that the radiation is of order one over D to the power D. The fact that radiation is so small explains why we could get local equations for a horizon uh, uh, in gravity. If radiation had been significant, stuff happening here would have gone non-locally and affected stuff happening here. You couldn't have got local equations. The fact that, that radiation is non-perturbatively small explains why there was an effective decoupling of the horizon with everything else. I said stuff. Okay. Uh, let me just... Let me just get to the, to the point I really wanted to make for this talk. Uh, yes, okay, this is what I really wanted to make. These two points. I'll make these two points and stop here. Okay, now in this talk, and I've gone very fast, I apologize. Um, in this talk, I've reviewed two distinct physical situations, which reduce to hydrodynamic, uh, gravitational situations, which reduce to hydrodynamic-like equations. One was large black holes in ADS, bearing slowly on length scale compared to, let's say one over the temperature of this black hole. The second was just ordinary black holes, black holes in flat space, but this easily generalizes to ADS space, okay? 
with whose variation can be much faster, just small compared to one over the uh, Schwarz, uh, uh, small, uh, small compared to the, sorry, large compared to the Schwarzschild radius divided by D. Since D is very large, this is much larger regime of validity. Okay. Now you might ask, is there a connection between these two things? If the answer is yes. If you do, uh, if you look at the fluid, if you look at um, uh, a situation where fluid gravity applies in large D, that's also a situation when, in which these membrane equations apply in large D. Okay? And I want to explain that to you here and I'm done then. Okay. Um, okay. So this was ADS space, yeah? I, sorry. This was ADS space, yeah? And consider configuration where R, the height of the event horizon is a function of where you are. And, um, okay. Uh, sorry, let me start again. I've got ADS space. And imagine that I've got this flat, you know, black brain type of, type of uh, object in ADS space. Within the membrane description, it's described by having a membrane that lives in ADS space and is varying however it's varying. Okay, now working out this membrane configuration, one can calculate the boundary stress tensor of the membrane configuration, essentially by doing this radiation type com computation. Com you can compute the boundary stress tensor and thereby identify the fluid from the fluid gravity correspondence. Okay, now, the fluid and the fluid gravity correspondence was labeled by a temperature and a velocity. This membrane here is labeled by some shape, r as a function of x and a velocity. You can find the coordinate change that turns the membrane equations into the fluid equations. Okay, we've done this very, very, uh, uh, very, uh, very precisely in our work. So, in this context, when you put these membranes in ADS space. These membrane equations are actually just a field redefinition, at least at large D, at least a field redefinition of the ordinary Navier-Stokes equations on the, uh, uh, on the fluid bound. Okay, now, these two equations are, are, are the same within the validity regime, but the membrane equations use variables that are much more flexible than those of the boundary fluid. This is because, you see, suppose you've got a membrane configuration that looks like this. Okay, a membrane configuration that looks like this. Such a membrane configuration corresponds from the point of view of fluid gravity to a singular fluid configuration. Because fluid dynamics requires a particular location of the horizon at every point underneath the bound. From the point of view of the membrane equations, it's perfectly fine. Okay? However, where their domains of validity over overlap, these are the same equations. What this suggests to me is that these, these membrane equations here are more flexible, use variables that are more flexible than those of Navier-Stokes equations. They allow you to describe configurations which would look singular from the point of view of the fluid equations, but actually are non-singular when viewed in these equations. Okay, so this suggests an, an interesting possibility to me. The possibility is that it, it might be possible, in fact, might well be possible to turn on initial conditions for, for these relativistic Navier-Stokes equations, then in a finite time evolved to what looks like a singularity from the variables of the Navier-Stokes equations. But actually, it's a fake singularity. It's possible to analytically continue past the singularity by moving to the correct variables of the problem, which in this context will be the membrane variables. I don't know if this makes any sense, and it's only for relativistic fluid dynamics, but it reminds me of this million dollar clay price. I thought I would end. Okay, uh, that's it. Uh, let me go to the... Uh, let me go to the same summary and discussions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, Sweeney, please. Um, Sweet, uh, compliments on the fact that you still bring the same energy to your lectures. Thank you. As you did many years ago. Uh, the, um, there is an analogy between uh, fluid flow and uh, the membranes. Uh, this is pretty well known in very simple circumstances in using between theory of elasticity and uh, fluid dynamics. 
I'm not sure that it has any any. What are the variables of the membrane in that context? Um, I forget now, okay. but I will I will send you something. Thank you very on much. Yeah. It. It's a textbook material actually, mm. but I'm I'm sure the geometry is much uh, simpler and more. No, it, um, it would be nice and low anything that people know. Yeah. But I want to ask you a very friendly question. Please. Uh, you were discovery that the Navier-Stokes equations are contained in Einstein's equation. Um, what does it tell me as a hydrodynamicist that I should know from a hydrodynamics point of view? It's a very friendly question. By no, you. no, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Taken very friendly. Yeah. Uh, I have no clue. Uh, I mean, what should it tell you? Um, I. You know, we tried, we and other people tried to make use of that. Maybe Amos, Amos also tried to make use of this correspondence to say something new about hydrodynamics. Not sure that was a very successful uh, enterprise. Um, I mean, the most interesting part of that, that, that duality was the structural aspects. That these two equations actually are the same. Um, that's what I find very fascinating. Yes. Like beyond, that. beyond that, I've not, maybe Amos or Loga, have you come, oh, let me say one more thing. It was very useful. Let me turn to that brag. It was very useful in understanding the structure of the equations of hydrodynamics. OK. Um, you know, this is not the kind of question you're interested in, but let me tell you. Anyway. OK. Um, suppose you've got a relativistic fluid. You want to know the equations of hydrodynamics are del mu t mu nu is equal to 0. t mu nu is determined in terms of pressure and velocity. You want to know uh, order by order in the derivative expansion. You want to know what are the constraints and terms that can come at 50th order in the derivative expansion. Okay. You know, Landau Lifshitz works it out to first order. Maybe somebody's worked it out to second order, usually got it wrong. Um, what can you say about, uh, about this, this expansion as a structural expansion? You know, one that you could continue. This has been the, the study of the, this correspondence and work motivated by it has completely revolutionized the understanding of that. Loga is one of the key players in this. Amos is another key player. So that kind of question about the structure of the equations, lots has been made. But about the behavior of the equations, I would say not very much. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask a question. Uh, I'm not in this field. So I wanted to know, uh, in reply to Srini's question, you had mentioned that these are all stable modes. So, uh, stable meaning the decay linear, yes. linear. Uh, but what about the Chan Shaker Friedman shoots mechanism where he talks about uh, a dissipative kind of instability when gravitational radiation radiate away that induces an instability? Where does it all stand with respect to? Okay, uh, first, I don't know about this instability, but I suspect that what you're talking about, see, as you said, what, what you're talking about requires this radiation. So yes. Now, in both situ in any situation where radiation is non-trivial, our system, this gravitational system, will not reduce to hydrogen. And the reason for that is very, very simple. Okay, it's th that the equations that we have are local. Now, if radiation is important, what's happening here sends radiation here and starts affecting what's happening here. Okay, so the if you ignore the radiation, you integrate it out, you generate an effective non-local. In our systems, radiation is not important uh, for. Two different reasons in the two different contexts. In the first context, it's because our black holes are so energetic that their event horizon has gone, in some colloquial sense, very near to the boundary of ADS. There's not enough space for you to radiate. We're in ADS space, not flat space. In the second situation, you're in flat space. But because we're in large D, radiation is suppressed like uh, 1 over D to the power D. And that's, you know, we're working in an expansion 1 over D. So 1 over d to the power d is a non-perturbative expression. Just ignore it. So the, any effect concerning radiation is not, not accounted for here. Yeah. OK, then I would like to thank you once more, the speaker. Uh, and we're moving on to the last talk of this session. <laughs>